If it wasn't possible for us to be forgiven, if God didn't extend that forgiveness to us, we'd be lost. We'd have no hope. And during this season, we're reminded that our time is now. Our time of judging is right now during this lifetime. This is, this is when God has his eyes on us to see if we're choosing his way or not. As we just marked in the Feast of Trumpets, that time when that reward will come to those who have lived faithfully. We're reminded of the fact that we need to be reconciled with God. Again, as mentioned in the theme of the Feast of Atonement. We know that forgiveness is important. It's, it's vital. There's, there's no life beyond this physical life without forgiveness of sin. But how much do we study the topic of forgiveness? How much do we meditate on it? Do we understand what God means when He talks about forgiveness? When His forgiveness is described? In the model prayer, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, we know that it says... As part of that model prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It doesn't say, forgive us and help us to learn how to forgive. It doesn't say, forgive us and we'll also try to forgive. It's a lot like Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, where we're warned against being judgmental. And we, and we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, that with the same yardstick, if you will, that you judge, you will likewise be judged. And with what measure you use, it shall be measured back to you again. We're going to receive the same, in same measure as we give. So as you and I go to ask God for forgiveness, are we confident that we are receiving it? Because in order to confidently go and seek forgiveness from God, that same forgiveness must be being developed in you and in me. And it has to be evident in our lives. When people see us, when people think about something that they saw you doing, something that they, they, they saw me doing, is it evident in our lives? As we know, this world is, is under the sway of our adversary. And everybody out there is influenced to a great deal. And we are influenced because we're among those people and because we were brought up in this world. And there are counterfeits. There are counterfeits to everything that God has made. So today we're going to take a look into Scripture to see what God means when He describes His forgiveness. And we're going to contrast that a little bit with some of the counterfeits that are not really forgiveness. The goal for us, for you and I, is to forgive as God forgives. And that's the title of this message. Forgive as God forgives. I'm just going to refer to a few verses in the next couple of minutes. You don't have to turn to all of these, but I'll mention where they are. Because as I was looking up this word forgive in the model prayer, forgive us as we forgive our debtors, it's translated various ways in Scripture. I believe it said that it's used 156 times, and it's translated various ways. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 20, it says that these disciples, when they were called, left their nets and followed him. And that word left is the same word that is translated forgive. And what, what did it mean when it said that they left their nets? It said they weren't coming back. When they left their nets, when they left their father in the boat, they were leaving for good. They weren't coming back. And that's the same sort of, there's very much a flavor of that in forgiving. God forgives in much that same way. It's a sort of a, an abandoning of that and a walking away not to return. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 18, a parallel scripture says they forsook their nets and followed Jesus. Again, that word forsook came from the same Greek word that means to forgive. Again, it means that they totally abandoned, that they walked away, they turned their back, they had no intention of returning, no intention of remembering or of considering 
In Mark chapter 10, in verse 28, the disciples were speaking to Christ, and they said, Lo, we have left all. We walked away from home. We walked away from parents and family. We walked away from that life that we had before and have followed you. And again, that word left there is the same word that's translated forgive in the, the verse in Matthew chapter 7. And we see in other places that, that one of the disciples said, I, I just count this as rubbish. All of the stuff that I've left behind to follow Jesus the Christ, count it as rubbish. So it's not valuing it. It's not hanging on to these things. When Jesus went down to the river to be baptized by John, John the Baptist said, why, why are you coming to me? You're so much greater than I. And Jesus said to him in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15, he said, suffer it, suffer it to be so. That word suffer is the same as the word for forgive, that afiemi in the, in the Greek. Allow it. Let this happen. Even though it doesn't sound right to you, let this happen. And in very much the same context, in Luke chapter 18 and verse 16, when Jesus told his disciples to suffer the little ones to come unto me. It didn't sound right. It didn't sound right in the, in the minds of the disciples that, that Jesus, who's got all this work to do and got these important words to speak, that he should be hindered by, by blessing these little children. Again, it's kind of like the, the issue with John the Baptist. It just didn't, didn't click in the minds of these men. But Jesus said, allow it. Suffer it. Suffer these ones to come unto me. So these are just some of the same, some of the times when that same term is used throughout the Bible. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Because we're called to give up a lot of things. Again, the apostles who said, you know, I count all those things as dung, or I count them as rubbish, or as just so much, they're so unimaginably unimportant compared to what we are called to. So in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 8, Again, he says, without a doubt, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them as dung that I may win Christ, that I may be with Christ, be developing the mind of Christ. The stuff that we're asked to leave behind because we're on a journey toward the kingdom of God. And none of these physical things are going to come with us. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Because again, I want us thinking along the lines of forgiveness and of, of letting things go, like we just read about in Philippians 3 verse 8. Yeah, I may have lost a job, I may have lost a home, I may have lost friends. Letting them go is very much what forgiveness is about, is letting things go. So in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31 speaking of things that we all should let go if, if they are glommed on to us. In verse 31 it says, let all bitterness let all wrath, let all anger, all clamor all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice these are all toxic to relationships. And again, we, we know that God is about relationships. He's not calling us to, to some existence apart from Him, but to be in His very family. People, people write into the church and they say, you know, how come God gave people free will? Well, He gave us free will because He wanted, us, he wanted to have a relationship with us. If you didn't want to be around people that had a mind of their own, you could fill your house with dolls and you could walk around and they would never say anything mean to you. You know, that you could, you could prop them up and position them this way and that and they'd do just what you wanted. It would all be... There'd be no relationship. 
but you also wouldn't have any stress, anything like that. All of these things are toxic to relationships. And of course, forgiveness is more of a healing of relationships. But all of these that we just heard in verse 31 can be the result when we don't forgive. And we can read in verse 32, but be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So I just want to cover a couple of points about some of the aspects of God's forgiveness. Certainly it won't be a thorough list. And I was having a hard time coming up with the right word for this, so maybe you can think of a better word. But for the first point, I wrote that God's forgiveness is bottomless. There's no end to it. If you take a look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, And again, why are we looking? Why do we care? Well, we care because, for one thing, we can glorify God for His great mercy and love. And for another thing, we can learn what He's expecting us to grow into, what He's expecting us to, to learn to be, to reach that maturity, that perfection, as we've already heard about today. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, it says, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? If I, you know, should I be really super righteous and forgive him seven times? But Jesus said unto him, in verse 22, no, seven times doesn't cut it. How about 70 times seven? And then there is a, a very educational parable on the subject of forgiveness that follows this. But I'm just going to stop there. It doesn't even mention in here, did my brother repent? It doesn't say, how often shall my brother sin against me and repent and I forgive him? It just says, no, forgive him. God is always forgiving. God has that as part of his nature. God is love. And forgiving, forgiveness is love. They're, they're fully intertwined. A second thing that I'd like us to take a look at is the, the concept that God is always ready to forgive. God is always ready to forgive. He plans ahead. He plans ahead. Here's what I'm going to do. We're in that fall feast season where we know that God has planned this ahead. Here's how I'm going to reconcile with the nations, with all the people. He's ready to forgive. He's anxious for that relationship to be healed. Are we? Are we, when somebody hurts us, are we? Is that our drive to, to mend those fences? To get back to a peaceful relationship, a growing relationship with one another. Let's take a brief look at Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 contains the, the parable of the prodigal son, as it's typically called. The son went to his father and said, I don't like it around here. Give me my half of the inheritance. I'm going to take off and go do what I want to do. And his father, in the parable, didn't scold him, didn't say anything to him. He fulfilled the request. In Luke chapter 15, of course, the, the son came to his senses. The son understood, came to the point of realizing that he had sinned. He says in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And in verse 20, we see the perspective of God the Father. Verse 20, as the son was coming to his father, while he was still a great way off, his father saw him. His father had somebody looking out for his son, or his father himself was on the lookout, waiting for the opportunity to mend that relationship to forgive. 
When, his, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Again, that anxiousness to, to help the relationship to be healed. The son had repented. He was coming in humility. We know that God's forgiveness is not without any stipulations. He calls us to repentance. He tells us, teaches us to be humble. Those components were there. And God was, again, God the Father in this analogy, was anxious to, to meet his son and heal that relationship, to forgive the sin, to forgive it entirely. As I was reading through Jeremiah this, this past week, we, we can see all sorts of doom pronounced on these nations that had, that had some of them had been used to, to chasten Israel, to punish Israel. All through Jeremiah chapter 48, you can read about the pride of Moab, the sins of Moab, the various lowercase g gods that they bowed down to. And God says, you, you were proud and you really stomped Israel into the dust and there is great punishment coming on you because God is just and there is a penalty, there's a, there is a effect for every cause. Just like Israel, when they continued to disobey God, were punished. But what is on God's mind? In the last verse of Jeremiah 48, here's what I have in mind for the future, God says. Yet I will bring again the captivity of Moab, meaning, meaning that I will bring their captives back to their land, not that I will cause the captivity. I will bring again the captivity of Moab in the latter days, said the Lord. So even though God punishes where there is a need to punish. He's ready to forgive. He's anxious to get to that day when the relationship can be made whole again. In the next chapter of Jeremiah, we see pronouncements in chapter 49, pronouncements against Ammon. But when we get to verse 6, he says, And afterward I will bring again the captivity of the children of Ammon, says the Eternal. And then we can read about Elam. And so all through here it talks about, talks about how God is anxious to, you know, in the end of verse 49, in the end of chapter 49, in verse 39, again he talks about, I will bring again the captives, I will bring the captives back to Elam. And we can read in Ezekiel chapter 16, I'll just refer to it, but God refers to Sodom and her daughters. There was a need for punishment, but what is God looking for? What's really on his mind? His mind is, I'm looking past this, just like he looks past the birth pangs at the end of his age to what the kingdom's going to be like. He's looking past this time of their judgment to the time when they will listen, because they will have minds to listen. And in Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 14, he uses similar language about Egypt. So again, God's ready to forgive. God, is that our mindset? Are we, you know, when, when we feel friction between a friend, when we feel friction between a loved one, friction between somebody at work, are we looking for a way to make that right? Are we looking for a way to mend that relationship? Because that's the way God forgives. He's looking for that time, for that opportunity A third point is that God's forgiveness is complete. When we think about those, again, I mentioned counterfeits, we can think of times when we maybe thought that's, that we had forgiven somebody and yet later on something happens and, and it stirs up emotions in our guts and, and we realize, you know, I really don't think I had forgiven them as fully as I thought I had. There must still be some anger in me over what happened before because I'm getting all worked up kind of more than I should be. But of course, God is not that way. God's forgiveness is complete. In Psalm 103, in verse 12, 
In Psalm 103 and verse 12, David says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins, our transgressions from us. He removes them from our sight. He removes them from his own sight when we repent, when he calls us to repentance, when we make that commitment to follow his way of life. In Psalm chapter 51, mentioned briefly in the last message and also in the first set of hymns, Psalm chapter 51, when King David, when it was brought to his attention how terribly wrong he had been in the sin of, of uh, Uriah and Bathsheba, he cries out at the start of his prayer in verse 1, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, and according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Blot them out. Uh, you know, if, if you're writing with ink, just, just paint right over those lines in your book. Or if, you have, if it's erasable, just erase it completely out of your book. He's saying, because that's how God forgives. When God forgives, it is it's gone. Now, we know that God is all-powerful. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 8. It would be impossible for God to lose track of something that had occurred. It would be impossible for God to forget anything. And that's just ridiculous, right? But we read in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, as he's talking about the new covenant, he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. And of course, God can't be old and forgetful. God can choose, though, to not remember. God can choose... And he says he does, and he will, and he has for you and I, as we go to him daily in repentance, it's erased from his mind. Is that how we ask him to help us? When somebody has annoyed us, when somebody has hurt us, when somebody's made us mad, whatever the situation might be, do we ask God to help us to forgive the way he forgives? Do we ask him to help us to basically erase it from our memory? And again, as we read earlier, it's it, you know, how often shall my brother sin against me? It doesn't mention that that they have to know what they did wrong, that they have to have apologized or repented. Because of course, if somebody tells you they've repented, you don't really know anyway, necessarily. We again, as was mentioned earlier, we don't know who all is yielding to God's will. We need to be learning to forgive the way that God forgives. In Colossians chapter 2, now when Stephen, the, the deacon, was killed while Saul stood by holding the, the coats, as he was breathing his last, he said, you know, Father, do not lay this sin to their charge. That's pretty pretty good God plain, God level forgiveness right there. And in Colossians chapter two and verse fourteen, there is a list. Of charges, there's a list of unrepented sins. If, if you know, for each one of us, there's a list of charges that's against us. That list of charges mentioned in Colossians 2:14, it says that is against us. In other words, that that sort of demands a penalty because we're guilty of those broken laws. But it says that Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He took those charges and he says, no, nope, you know, those charges of yours, those charges of mine that we've repented of, he says, just put those on my tab. I'm not going to hold them responsible for that. 
maybe some of us will get the chance at the at the feast this year if we have some extra second tithe and we're in the restaurant and and we see a family over there an older couple or a couple with kids or maybe some of us will have the chance to say you know waitress and put that on my tab that's obviously very small compared to what Jesus did for us but it's a beginning to think of to think on the same level that Jesus thought on when he said he said because of course when he was crucified there was a piece of paper right there that says you know he claimed to be a king that was basically his charge that was his his crime but he said put their charges with mine I'll I'll take care of that so God's forgiveness is complete they've been paid we just have to go and and seek that forgiveness and seek that repent ask God to give us that true repentance but again the point for us today is the fact that we need to be asking God to make that the way we look at forgiveness that we need to be asking God to help us to forgive on the same level that he does now perhaps this hasn't happened to you but I can think of times when I've somebody's done something to me and it's just really made me irate and I don't say anything to them you know somebody at work let's say and you know time goes by a couple weeks go by or maybe a month goes by and okay we're back on speaking terms and I can talk peaceably to this person there's the saying that time heals all wounds but what I just described to you of course isn't forgiveness it's just well you know I'm not livid anymore I'm not fuming mad anymore but leaving that kind of anger unresolved and un, untapped and and just letting it fester of course leads to a very weak relationship and it can lead us to bitterness in Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 we are told to follow peace with all all people and holiness be holy in our conduct and of course part of that is being ready and willing to forgive because without these we read no one of us will make it into the kingdom verse 15 he says looking diligently lest any of us fail of the grace of God and again the grace of God what does that mean that means acting the way God would have us act that means showing the kind of love that he shows us in scripture showing the kind of forgiveness that he teaches us about here because we have to be diligent as it says in verse 15 because we live in this world and we can get caught up in well here's how people do it around here um, we can see examples all around us of God's law being not followed I hope we're all grateful for the chance to come together and and sharpen one another's thinking with that fellowship that we have together because we need that help looking diligently lest any of us fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled if there's a, a some sort of a strife between two employees at work or between the, the boss and one employee it can make the whole work environment toxic it can just make it a real unpleasant place to be and of course the same could be said for a, for a church hall or for any sort of a group of people that bitterness that that failure to forgive just makes it a really unpleasant place to be and God has called us to lean to him God has called us to adopt his way of doing things to see things from his perspective a second sort of a counterfeit is you've probably heard it said well I can forgive that person but I'm never gonna forget you've probably heard that said and of course that leads us right back to where we were if you're if if we're carrying around the memory of the hurt you know I'm just gonna nurture that hurt like a little baby I'm just gonna carry it around for the rest of my life that that pain it felt when you said that to me or when you did that to me I'm just gonna cherish it and nourish it 
and let it grow big and strong. Obviously, that's not what forgiveness is. If a friend, you know, or, or somebody that we've had some past um, experiences with, maybe somebody's let us down, and then uh, a while later, well, they do the same thing. They let us down again. Are we going to be of the mindset of, well, I knew that they would probably do that again. I saw that coming because that's just who they are. Or are we going to be of the mindset of, of forgiveness and of, of allowing them the space to grow and of appreciating, appreciating that there is some growth and that there is um, times of refreshing. I want us to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as we wind down here. In 1 Corinthians 13, sort of informally known as the love chapter, but in place of charity here, I want us to think forgiveness as we take a look at some of these verses. It says in well, it starts off in verse 1. He says, Though I can speak in tongues, but not have God's love, not be forgiving, it's pretty pointless. And in verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy, the, the ability to teach, to understand all these scriptures, to, to give terrific uh, sermons or, or, or instruction, and I knew everything and had all sorts of faith, but he says at the end of verse 2, if I do not have God's love, if I'm not forgiving, then I'm nothing. Because we know, as it says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 35, that if any of us does not forgive, we will not receive God's forgiveness. If any of us does not from our heart, it says in Matthew 18 and 35, does not from our heart forgive, then we will not be on the receiving end of God's forgiveness. In verse 3 it says, If I was to give all my goods away and give my body to be burned, if I'm not doing it out of love, and all of the components of love, including forgiveness, then it profits me nothing. I've gained nothing. So in verse 4 it says, Love suffers long. Forgiveness suffers long. It's interesting that long-suffering or a willingness to forgive the faults of others is mentioned first. I wrote down a couple of excerpts from Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible. And it says, in reference to long-suffering, it says, charity, charity can endure evil, injury, and provocation without being filled with resentment or indignation or a desire for revenge. It makes the mind firm, gives it power over the angry passions, and furnishes it with a persevering patience that shall rather wait and wish for the reformation of a brother that looks towards, I hope he repents of that. I hope she repents of that. rather than flying out in resentment of his conduct. It will put up with many slights and neglects from the person it loves, and it will wait long to see the kindly effects of such patience on that person. So to be patient, to show patience, to give, again, that, that other person time to grow, time to see what their time for God to work in their mind. It very well translates into this topic of forgiveness, even though it's referring of course, to godly love. But again, God is love, and forgiveness is one of the ways that he shows his love. So it's not like it's two different subjects. Continuing in 13 and verse 4, it says, Love does not envy. Love does not vaunt itself. And under this category of vaunting itself, it says, True love, or we could say forgiveness, subdues pride and looking for our own glory. It is not apt to despise others or trample on them or treat them with contempt and scorn because that's exactly how we would treat people if they had done something and we hadn't forgiven them. We would look down on them. We would 
be scornful of them. It continues and it says, charity calms the angry passions instead of raising them. So in other words, it, forgiveness calms us down rather than sort of ramping up the, the, the animosity there. It is not froward, nor stubborn and intractable. Intractable, I'm not even going to listen to you. I don't even care what you have to say. That's what it would be to be intractable. And that's the opposite of what forgiveness is. It is not apt to be cross, it says, or contradictory. In verse 5 it says, Love, and I will say forgiveness, does not seek her own. And in the commentary it said, Love is the antithesis of selfishness. Love never seeks its own to the hurt of others or with the neglect of others. In fact, it often neglects its own for the sake of others. So again, there's that, I can hold on to you and cherish this little hurt, this little slight that you did to me, or I can let it go. I can let it go, I can leave it behind, like, like, like the disciples left their nets, left their past lives behind. It continues in verse 5 and it says that charity, forgiveness, is not easily provoked. So again it says it's, it's not exasperated, it's not just ready to, ready to burst from, from already having held a grudge from the previous incident. We need to ask God to help us to not have resentment. We need to ask God to help us to have that attitude of, I want to be reconciled. I want that, that peace, that, that being, being one, to, to join that God talks about in scriptures. Love, it says, thinks no evil at the end of verse 5. And in the commentary, it, it rendered it this way. It says, love or forgiveness does not cling to malice. It does not seek revenge. It isn't soon angry, and it doesn't stay angry long. It does not suspect evil of others. You know, are, am I suspicious when somebody comes up to me and, and says something to me? If I am, then I'm not operating in this, in this mode. It says it will incline to... It's a hard sentence. It will incline to disbelieve evidence against the person it affects. You've probably been standing around sometime and somebody walks up to you and hopefully not. I mean, there, there are contexts in which it would not be gossip, but somebody says, here's, here's what's, what somebody did or what I saw happen. And it would be best if we would not take that person's word for it, but that we would expect the best, that we would, that we would, again, think no evil until we've had a chance to talk to that individual ourselves. And of course, if you can see that coming, then you should say, stop, I don't, you know, you should go and talk to that person if, if that sort of thing happens to you. Because we ought to be going to one another and working things out amongst each other rather than carrying our stories around. So I could continue with, with several more paragraphs of this, but as we read down through chapter 13, it says in verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Bears all things. It, or in another, another translation, it says covers all things. Like we read that love covers the multitude of sins. Are we willing to cover over, to overlook, to forgive some slight that somebody does to us, whether it was whether it was intentional or unintentional? Maybe we just imagined it. Maybe they had no wish to be harmful to us. Are we willing to cover it over? Love hopes all things, just like forgiveness does. It endures all things. Again, God's love is, God's forgiveness is bottomless. It doesn't end unless, of course, one of us were to outright reject his authority in our life. But instead of that, 
it continues and we can keep drawing on that we can go to him every day and say father I I did it again please forgive me so in verse 8 he says love never fails forgiveness never fails God's forgiveness doesn't again doesn't run out it doesn't come to a certain point and now he says okay you reached 490 like we read in one verse that's all sorry no love and forgiveness never fail we're told in 2nd Corinthians 13 verse 5 to be examining ourselves to be examining ourselves to be sort of checking ourselves getting those course corrections finding out am I in line with God's will am I doing things his way and we need to be doing that on a daily basis doing our Bible study doing our prayer going to God am I suspicious of people am I cynical am I pessimistic do I assume something that I shouldn't be how am I doing it forgiving am I getting closer to the standards of God we all start out incredibly far from God's standards and as we look to him as we ask him to teach us he helps us to get closer to those standards a good question that you might ask yourself from time to time is if God is forgiving me in the same manner that I'm forgiving those people around me am I going to be in the kingdom because if I'm forgiving people sort of if I'm forgiving others around me partly somewhat some of the time then I'm not living up to the standard that God has set and so I of course and we will never reach that completely mature state but we need to be stretching toward it so we need to be taking stock in our life and so I just would encourage you to ask God to help you to forgive as he forgives